I want to do a quick example of wave functions in quantum mechanics, in particular of how we think about probability in relation to wave functions, the probability that a quantum particle is at a particular position or in a particular range. So the example I want to talk about, I've got this initial state that I've specified here for a particular particle that has a wave function of ax squared times l minus x if you're between 0 and l, and 0 outside of that range. You can see it's continuous, it's sort of parabolic near x equals 0, and comes back down to 0 x equals l. That's our shape. And I want to know what's the probability that if I make a measurement, I will find this particle to be between 0 and l over 2 in that range. That's my question. And so what we need to do is understand how the wave function teaches us about that. Well, we can talk about standard quantum mechanical questions. In quantum mechanics, or anything, I guess, uh, the total probability, you're adding up probabilities of a range of possibilities, the total probability is you add up, you sum over all possible, in our case, positions x that you can find this particle, and you add up the probability of being at each position. There's a little bit of fibbing here about continuous versus discrete systems that I'm brushing over. If you do this carefully, you get it right, but uh, bear with me. So sum over possible measurement outcomes, x, add up the probabilities of x. That's the total probability of a collection of measurements. Well, for us, in quantum mechanics, the probability of some measured outcome is you take the absolute squared of a bracket, a quantum amplitude, for that outcome. And in particular, for us, if we start in a state psi, and we want to ask the question, hey, are you in state x, the position state x? This bracket of the x bra with a psi ket is how you figure out that quantum amplitude. Uh, if you aren't a quantum amplitude person, don't worry about it because this is the definition of the wave function. And so what we have to do is just add up sum over x of the absolute square of psi of x. That is the idea. Now, again, continuous versus discrete. This is written in sort of a discrete measurement point. If this were some discrete lattice of positions, we sum over each position. In the continuous world, which is what we seem to live in, we actually have to have the continuous version of a sum. And fortunately, we have calculus as a tool that teaches us all sorts of wonderful things about continuous sums. That's just an integral. This is the integral of the absolute square of psi of x, absolute square, dx, over whatever range we care about. I suppose, in the end, we go from 0 to, well, I'll put a question mark there because there are a couple different things we're going to need to do. So if I'm integrating the absolute square of psi, then I should probably draw myself a quick little graph to see what that looks like. Again, these are just conceptual sketches, but let's see what it looks like in the end. I'll do a quick graph. Graph here. Here's my L. This is x. This is a graph of psi squared. I've got labels. And if I want to draw that graph, psi squared, I guess, uh, my psi looks like this. It's going to be very flat at x equals 0, proportional to x to the fourth and it'll be very sharply peaked over here. So I suppose it'll look something like very flat, very flat, very flat, peak sharply up and back down. There is a rough sketch of what my wave function squared will look like. And if I'm doing the probability of finding x less than L over 2, well, L over 2 is still here. And so that probability is going to be, well, if I just look at this, here's a little shaded region. I can somewhere in here, that's, that's the region I care about. So to find the probability, all I need to do is say, hey, here's the total probability. What fraction of that total area under the curve is in my shaded region? That is the probability of finding the particle at position x less than L over 2. All right. Again, calculus can help us with this rather than having to depend on rough sketches to give me an idea. If I had to look at that, I don't even know how much I trust this, but if I had to look at that, I'd say 20% maybe, 10%, I, something in that range, 10 to 20% probably is the right sort of estimate of what fraction of that area. Here are the steps that I'm going to use to do this, and there are a couple different ways. The way I almost always do this is a two-step process. I start by saying, first, let's normalize psi of x, normalize my wave function. What's that mean? That means I want it to be that the total probability adds up to 1. So this integral, in fact, assumes a normalized wave function. This whole formalism assumed a normalized quantum state. So to have a normalized wave function, that means if I go from 0 to L, really from minus infinity to infinity, but it's 0 outside of that range, if I go from 0 to L, I'd better come up with a total probability of 1. 
Uh, so that's going to be a, my first step. Then my second step will be find the fraction up to L over 2, and that'll be my next step. So, okay, to normalize, th these two steps are actually going to look very, very similar because they're both doing an integral, just, just with different limits. So let me do the normalization first. For normalization, I want to take this thing, the integral from 0 to L of the absolute square of psi. What will that be? Well, these are all real numbers, so I don't need to worry about the absolute value business, but from 0 to L of a x squared a minus x squared dx, which I suppose is a squared, since that's a constant, I pull it out, 0 to L of x to the fourth a minus x squared dx. That is a simple but tedious integral to deal with. There are going to be three terms. It's ugly, and they're all, but they're all, they're, they're all just polynomial terms. You can do this just fine after having had a semester of calculus or something. It's not that bad. Uh, I'll just go ahead and say that that equals, jot this down, um, equals a squared x to the fifth times one seventh x squared minus one third ax plus one fifth a squared. That's my integral uh, evaluated. Oh god, whoops, sorry. L's, L's. This is what I get what I get for changing notation mid-problem. Uh, and this was supposed to be L. Oh curses. I've changed notation. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, forgive me. I changed notation for my notes and then didn't change it up here. So, okay, uh, I, uh, I've, I've got this, this business evaluated from 0 to L, and I want that to equal 1 for my normalization. That's what I need for normalization. So, again, I've got, woo, hey, okay, well, I don't need that anymore, right? Uh, I want to plug in x equals L, and then plug in x equals 0. You can see the x equals 0 one is going to go to 0 right away. So, this is a squared times, well, I'm going to have an L to the fifth overall, uh, L to the seventh overall in every turn, uh, L to the seventh times, sorry for dropping this sheet. Again, I'm skipping, term, skipping steps just so we can save ourselves some time, uh, times 1 divided by 105. 105 happens to be the least common multiple of 3, 5, and 7, so that's where that came from. Okay, that is this thing. That has to equal 1. So I can solve then. A is equal to, what is it? It is the square root of 105 over L to the 7th. That is a ridiculous term. But, you know, that's what we get sometimes. You don't necessarily get any sort of pretty answers. So that is my normalization constant. And so if I were to plug that back in then, uh, my step 2, let me do step 2 in a slightly different color just to distinguish a little. My step two, then, is to find my fraction going up to L over 2, the integral from 0 to L over 2 of a x squared L minus x dx, uh, squared, sorry, squared. Uh, that integral, if I plug in my value of a, there's an a squared coming out here, that's going to be 105 over L to the seventh times, hey, that's my A squared. I'll just plug this in. Uh, X to the fifth times 1 seventh X squared minus 1 third LX plus 1 fifth L squared from 0 to L over 2. That's my integral. I'm just plugging in the different limits now instead of there. I've got the same point. I've got my a squared plugged in for what that value of a is to be normalized. Again, you can work through this. Plug in L over 2 in all those places. You'll see that I will get an L to the 7th that will cancel out the L to the 7th. That's an important double check that your answer will come out to be dimensionless. It should, the probability shouldn't depend on how big the well was. It shouldn't change based on how big the well is. I've got this, and then uh, if I plug that in, I'll just quote the result. Uh, I end up getting 29 over 128 
is the is the ratio I end up getting. You can check that at home, plug in those numbers if you want to see if you're doing it right. I get that ratio, which is about 22.6%. So a little less than a quarter. I guess I underestimated a little bit how much that fraction was, but from eyeballing a rough sketch that I just made up, it's not half bad. So, all right, 22.6%. That's how we do these calculations. Again, conceptually, it's not that bad. Conceptually, you draw a graph of psi, then you draw a graph of the absolute square of psi, and you just look in the re how, how big a fraction of my total region is that region I care about. What's the probability of measuring in between 0 and L over 2? Well, it's that fraction. And then you just use calculus to make formal what that fraction is. The normalization is calculating the total area. And once you've got the normalization, then you're, you're effectively divided by the total area to find what your probability is of being in that range. That's the story, and uh, it's uh, once you've practiced it a few times, it really starts to get pretty second nature. It's pretty pretty straightforward once you know what you're doing, up to and of course the tedious algebra and calculus in the middle.